What you're looking at now is some of the last few remaining remnants of Otto Trium, a fursuit mascot and the main character from an Estonian kids show by the same name. During his run in the mid 90s, Otto Trium was widely known and loved by children from all across the country, making him a celebrity. Yet despite the success of the show, due to mysterious and disturbing circumstances, every single episode of Otto Trium has been completely lost and wiped off the face of the earth. Autotrin was mainly the merged creation of Tono Pavo, who worked as a producer and manager at TV3, the Estonian channel that would create and air the show, and producer slash entertainer and actor Vino Lossar, who would be the one to don the furry mascot. The show followed the adventures of a woolly dinosaur called Autotrin, from a place called Miso Maso Land. And from what little remains of the show online, Otto Trin appears to have been a combination of human and costume actors, similar to something like Sesame Street, where half of the show seems to be scripted edutainment style and the rest seems to be contests and game shows. At the height of the show's popularity, Otto Trin was everywhere. He appeared at live events, at birthday parties, and even on dairy products. He had his own music cassette tapes, a bedtime radio show, and even had his own chocolate brand. There was apparently one time when the show hosted a birthday party for Otto Trin, and 1600 children showed up to the event. After the event, Venal Lassar was quoted saying, My friend Tuno and I were completely bewildered. We never thought that so many children would come. The show will definitely continue this season. There would not be any new seasons of the show because later on that year, on Christmas Eve of 1997, Tony Pavo would be driving on the Tallinn Narva Highway around 6 o'clock in the evening. Due to unknown circumstances, Pavo's vehicle would cut through all lanes of traffic and veer off into the opposite lane of the highway, colliding with two opposing vehicles and taking the lives of two people that night the driver of the first car, and a five-year-old child, seated passenger in the second vehicle. Pavo would go through a rough and very public legal battle that would end up with him sentenced to three years probation. The case would end up causing so much controversy for TV3 and for the show that Otto Trin would end up being cancelled and discontinued that same year. Not only that, but seemingly out of fear or of the need to distance themselves from the incident, the channel wiped off all evidence and refused to talk about the show for years after. And so from that day on, Otto Trin just seemingly vanished. It's especially strange that the show is as lost as it is now, considering not only Otto Trin's popularity but also that the series ran for 5 years, from 1993 to 1998, and throughout that entire time. There has been no VHS or DVD releases of the show, no reruns, and not even a single homemade recording to surface. Aside from a few images and articles, this wildly popular childhood figure had been completely forgotten. Directly following this cancellation of the show, Vino would go on to create a new show called Yale Seyape. Only this time, he plays a sidekick role to a new mascot figure. Unlike Otto Trin, episodes of this show can be found online, and by watching them, we can perhaps get an idea on how the previous show was like. Yalise Yape would see great success, and although never got as popular as Otto Trin, it ran for 7 seasons from 1998 to 2001. 
pushing Vino into the forefront and fully establishing his career as a performer and child entertainer. In 2016, things were finally starting to look up. Due to the fact that TV3 were celebrating their 20th birthday, a bunch of old shows from the 90s were showcased from the early days of the channel's life. And one of these shows was Auto Trend. First, there was what seems to be the opening credits of the show, which showcased Auto Trend running around town, interacting with people, and even showed a couple of clips from different episodes. The second release part was a 2016 interview with Vino himself, where some footage from Auto Trend was also shown. And the third was apparently a full-length, high-quality episode uploaded on the channel's website. This upload seems to have been taken down since. But at the very least, it seemed like TV3, after two decades of silence, were finally starting to acknowledge the show and release some episodes. However, this wouldn't last long. In 2019, Vino himself, the face of Auto Trend and of many shows that followed, would be accused and charged of abuse of a minor under the age of 10. After his arrest, the police did a thorough search of all his computers, phones, and tablets, which all came back clear. In the midst of everything, an external hard drive was found among Losar's things, on which 19 images and 4 videos of child porn was found on the device. This evidence, as well as the victim's testimony, would land him 5 years jail in suspended sentence, only 4 months of which is actual prison time. The rest was probation and obligated participation in social programs. A man known as perhaps the most famous child entertainer in the 1990s, who played one of the most famous and beloved roles in Estonian children entertainment, turned out to have been a predator this entire time. This would be the ending blow for the show's potential recovery, as from this day on, Auto Trend would be known as one of the most cursed children's shows out there, where two of his creators both ended up being felons, one for ending the lives of two people, and the other for being a convicted pedophile. The search for the show is still ongoing, even though it is among the most less known of lost media cases. The fact that TV3 released footage of the show in 2016 seems good enough proof that somewhere within their archives, the show still exists. But with the disturbing reality and controversy surrounding it, I don't know if we'll ever see a legitimate re-release or rerun of it. A forgotten lost show. A show that brought joy and laughter to many children at the time. But underneath it all, held the disturbing reality due to the actions of his creators. In the 1960s, America was undergoing a spiritual revolution. A counterculture was brewing beneath the surface of society challenging and rejecting mainstream norms. This cultural shift created fertile ground for the exploration of all things new, strange, and unconventional. Within this era of experimentation emerged an enigmatic underground film known as Lucifer Rising. Set against the backdrop of ancient Egypt, Lucifer Rising delved into the portrayal of an occult ritual conducted by the deities from that time. The objective was to summon the enigmatic dark angel, Lucifer, in a quest to usher in a new epoch of the occult, a new age. The brilliant mind behind this creation was Kenneth Anger, a unique filmmaker who had been deeply involved in experimental underground movies for more than 30 years back then. But the idea of Lucifer rising didn't just come out of nowhere. Inger claims it came to him as a cinematic representation of the complex things he had learned during his time with the mysterious occult group called Ordo Templi Orientis, a secret society he had joined years before. Kenneth Anger was always interested in occult and magical teachings, 
and that really comes through in Lucifer Rising. The sounds in the movie were made by Jimmy Page, the guitarist player from the famous band Led Zeppelin. Both of them working together created a lot of excitement and interest, pulling people in and creating a lot of curiosity around the film. In the early stages of production, Anger encountered a young man named Bobby Boussoulet, who was then performing for his band, the Arcustra. Anger was highly impressed by Boussoulet, so much so that Anger walked up to him post-performance and handed him the role to play Lucifer in his movie. The two of them then came to an agreement. Boussoulet would play the role of Lucifer, and he would live with Anger for the entirety of the development of the film. In 1966, Anger and his team would travel to Egypt, and the filming would begin. And from the very get-go, there would be various issues that would pop up that would drastically delay the production. The actress who played the goddess Lilith would accuse Anger of hypnotizing her into doing actions against her consent. While at the same time, Anger would accuse her of importing drugs into Egypt and risking serious legal trouble for everyone involved. Tensions would also start rising between Anger and Boussoulet over artistic differences and production struggles, as Boussoulet became increasingly annoyed with the slow production of the film, causing the two of them to have a bad falling out and Boussoulet to leave the production in 1967. And this is where the case gets interesting. Because once Boussoulet moved out of their shared home, he would be accused by Anger of not only stealing his possessions, but also of stealing four reels of film, totaling 1,600 feet of footage for Lucifer Rising. And while Boussoulet claims innocent, Anger insisted that Boussoulet took the reels and either destroyed them or had allegedly buried them somewhere in the California desert, causing them near half of the film to be lost. See, the interesting thing about Boussoulet was that after leaving San Francisco, he would come in contact with none other than cult leader Charles Manson, and the two would become great friends. One account alleged that the two held the stolen footage and even demanded a $10,000 ransom from anger, which he refused. Finding himself in a bit of a tough situation, anger would have to re-edit the remaining footage that wasn't stolen into a much shorter film named Invocation of My Demon Brother. Then he would set out to refilm and reconstruct a new Lucifer Rising once again. Two years down the line, Boussoulet along with other members of the Manson family would pay a visit to his former music teacher. This visit was supposedly related to some money owed from a previous drug deal. However, tragically, it would take a dark turn and end up with Boussoulet brutally torturing and killing the man. Boussoulet would flee the scene, taking the man's car. His escape was short-lived as the car broke down in a remote location, leading the police to discover him asleep inside. Upon his arrest, the police would find the murder weapon, a knife, in his possession. As a consequence of his actions, Boussoulet received a life sentence. And just a few days later, the remaining members of the Manson family carried out the infamous Tate LaBianca murders. Surprisingly, however, Boussoulet's involvement with the film didn't end there. While the rest of the footage was lost forever, after hearing that the Led Zeppelin guitarist wasn't making music for the film anymore, Boussoulet would offer to compose a soundtrack for Lucifer Rising himself in a letter he would write to Anger from prison. Eventually, they would both come to an agreement, and Boussoulet would compose a complete soundtrack for the new cut of the film. In 1980, the soundtrack of the film would be finished. Ecstatic with the work, Anger incorporated it into his film and finally fully released it in December of that same year. Interestingly, the supposed lost footage from the original cut was not the only missing Lucifer Rising cut. The version featuring Jimmy Page's soundtrack received only a limited release, with approximately four copies known to have existed in the mid-1980s. It then became forgotten for about three decades, and the film would not be seen in public again until March of 2009, 
when a VHS rip was suddenly made available for download via torrent. Another cut was also discovered in April of 2014 by searching through Anger's archives, discovering the footage that was misplaced in an unlabeled box many years previously. This early cut contains footage that was removed from the final cut. The status of the original Lucifer Rising cut, however, depends greatly on which side was being truthful within their account. If Anger did indeed produce 1600 feet reels of footage that was stolen, its survival remains completely unclear. The footage was either destroyed or buried in the California desert by Beausoleil and or Charles Manson. Or the footage may be in possession of an unidentified individual. If Beausoleil's account is to be believed, no such footage ever existed. The only confirmed remnants of the original cut were included in the 1969 film, Invocation of My Demon Brother, which has since been made viewable on YouTube. The movie's rough journey from its inception to its eventual completion, the story of its last original cut, the disturbing fate of its lead actor, and its connection with Charles Manson's cult has made Lucifer Rising to be considered for a while as the holy grail of all lost films. Will the original cut ever be found? I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Following a major attack on the United States in September of 2001, US President George W. Bush's administration would launch a military campaign days later that would be known as the War on Terror. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. The Guantanamo Bay detention camp would open only a year after that, a military prison for the primary purpose of detaining individuals suspected of terrorism. And from the very start of its opening, the military prison would be mixed up in tons of controversies, allegations of severe human rights violations, indefinite detentions, and torture methods that would cause the public as well as many humanitarian organizations to condemn it. Around 2009, a small Scottish game development studio, known for making small flash and mobile games by the name of T Enterprise, would announce their first big AA video game that would be coming to the Xbox 360 and PC, titled Rendition Guantanamo, a game entirely based on and set inside Guantanamo Bay Prison. The game's development coincided with a period during which the potential closure of Guantanamo Bay was being contemplated by the then US President Barack Obama. The game's envisioned setting was January 2010, a time when T Enterprise assumed the impending closure of the camp. The narrative revolved around a Yemeni detainee cast within a Guantanamo Bay no longer overseen by the US government, but rather controlled by paramilitary operatives. In this scenario, the mercenaries employed not only brutal torture methods on the prisoners but also subjected them to inhumane scientific experiments. The player's objective centered on orchestrating an escape from the confines of the camp, taking down their captors, and rescuing their captive son. The game was likely conceived as a potential first-person or third-person shooter experience. Of course, as you could guess, the announcement of the game would come with a wave of hate, backlash, and concern from the general public. And the game would attract even more attention from mainstream media when T Enterprise revealed its collaboration with Mozan Beck, a former detainee at Guantanamo Bay who served as a consultant for the project. Beck's account paints a grim picture of his time in detention and his participation in the development of the game was primarily driven by the intent to utilize his first-hand knowledge of the prison's layout for accurate design. 
The game's central character was not Beck, but an inmate named Adam, who would receive guidance from Beck on escape into prison. The main grip, however, was with Beck's involvement. Media sites spread accusations claiming that T Enterprise hiring Beck meant they were working with someone who allegedly was connected to terrorist organizations, and that the game would be promoting propaganda. The increasing backlash faced by T Enterprise eventually proved too much, and the game subsequently was cancelled. The interesting thing is, is that around the time of the announcement, the studio claimed that the game was around 25% done, with the development having already spent a year and two months producing the game, proving that there was perhaps an alpha version of the game that existed. But sadly, none of the game's materials were ever accessible, with the only lasting evidence of it even existing being the short teaser trailer, which it itself was considered lost media for many years. It was only thanks to YouTuber NeoGame the Video Game Archive, who managed to find this lost trailer and upload it in 2019. The whole development cycle of the game is shrouded in mystery, from the sketchy studio itself, to their collaboration with Beg, and even to the state of the actual game. How much of the game was actually made? And if things would have perhaps went a bit different, would the game have actually even released? The search for rendition Guantanamo is still ongoing, even though it is a newer lost media case. But until then, rendition Guantanamo will stay a lost game. A controversial video game with accusations of propaganda. A lost short film linked to one of the most brutal cults in American history. And a children's show whose creators turned out to be monsters. The world of lost media never fails to amaze with its wide range of cases that range from the interesting to the downright disturbing. And that's gonna be it for today's video. I hope you've enjoyed your stay, and I will see you all very soon.